a sore throat in a child must not be neglected, must not be ignored. Because if it is caused by strep, it could indeed lead to, to heart disease. If the child gets a penicillin injection, it stops it, it almost uh, uh, abolishes the condition. The reason we've not been successful in using penicillin is because a lot of people are not aware that a sore throat in a child could lead to a broken heart. In many of our practice here, and many patients coming to us, they usually come in late, having developed already shortness of breath and swelling of the body. And often when that happens, the next thing that is needed is actually an operation. Uh, so, that, so there can be a whole combination of symptoms. Most commonly it's the fever and the joint pains. All those symptoms will get better. But the, there's one other part of the body that's affected often in a rheumatic fever, and that's the heart valves. So if the disease is um, not recognised early and preventative measures are not put in place, then that person then will need to have cardiac surgery. And when I think about cardiac surgery for rheumatic heart disease, I think about two types of surgery, really. So one is replacement of the valve, and then the second type I think about is um, valve repair, where the surgeon goes in and um, just fixes the valve so it works correctly without having to replace the valve. I think that's a really important distinction because of the implications. Edward required his first open heart surgery at age eight. He had to make the long journey down to the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne. By age nine, Edward required his second open heart surgery where three of his cardiac valves had to be repaired, the mitral, aortic and tricuspid valve. And he really spent around age 13 to age 15 barely uh, being able to walk around. He was very limited in his activities. Age 15, when I talked to him about needing another heart operation, he knew that. He knew that he couldn't live like this. This time there was no option for repairing. Uh, the only operation <coughs> that was an option for him is to replace his heart valves with a mechanical valve. Edward, if we don't do anything, would die suddenly or just progressively suffocating in a matter of weeks. His heart is really at the end of what he can cope, but he's got absolutely no choice, he's got nowhere to go, and he has to do, have it done relatively quickly. After you had your last surgery, do you, do you remember when that was? Was it a few years ago? In the old hospital. Yeah, in the old hospital, yeah. Yeah. Did you get your strength back after the last operation? Yeah. And so how are you feeling now? <coughs> How's your health at the moment? Mm. Bad. What we see in the echo is quite clear. If you, if you look at, at the mitral valve, it should open like that, really like that. It should move. If you look at the valve of Edward, it's just doing this. That's all it does. And if you look at an opening that should be open like that of the valve, now the opening that Edward has got is barely about this size. Lily Wu, tomorrow for the surgery. Yep. Do you know what the, what the surgeons are going to be doing? Um, moving the sick valve and putting the new valve. Yeah, that's exactly right. Tomorrow what you have to realise is that the life of Edward will change. Because starting tomorrow, Edward will have two mechanical valves in his heart and he's going to have to take anticoagulation tabs to make the blood thinner every day of his life. If he's taking this treatment, if he's disciplined, if he doesn't do things that are wrong, um, he's got excellent chances to live until the age of 40, 50, maybe 60, 70 years. He's going to have more problems over the course of his lifetime, he's going to have issues with bleeding because of the tablets we have. Uh, he may have issues needing replacement of one of these valves, but he's likely to have a good life in good, healthy conditions. So Lydia, well, I know that you're nervous about having the surgery tomorrow. Yeah. On the upside is that we hope that you're going to feel better after the surgery. Yeah. yeah. What, what things are you looking forward to doing after you've had the surgery? Walk around a lot, uh, running around. Yeah. <coughs> Any sports you want to be able to do? Mm. Football. Yeah. yeah. 
be nice to be able to kick the footy with your friends, hey? Yeah. yeah. The first difficulty when I start the surgery is to get into the chest. It's been operated twice before. There's a lot of scar tissue. The more you operate the patients, the more scar tissue you have. So the danger is to injure the heart as you get into the chest. Once I'm in the chest, I go on a cardiopulmonary bypass, the heart-lung machine that does the job of the heart and the lung, so I can arrest the heart, and once the heart is arrested, I will resect the mitral valve, I will resect the aortic valve, and I will place the two valves. I'm optimistic in nature, so I'm always convinced that everything will go uh, very fine, but we have to be realistic. How do you feel? You good? You, you're good now? Yeah. You feel better? You were very sick, huh? You know what you're going to have to look after very well? Yeah. What is it? My valve. Yeah. And to look after the valve, what do you have to do? Uh, take the warfarin medication. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. Yeah, you're going to have to be very, very serious with that. You're going to be good and you're going to play footy or run with your friends, but you're going to have to take your medications. If it's discipline, it's all right. It's going to be all right. If it's not discipline, then it's going to go nowhere. It's going to die. So we're talking about a child who was non-compliant with their medications, and now we were faced with a situation where we had to ask Edward to take a medicine every single day of his life. So Edward, this is what your heart looks like. And inside your heart, you've got four doors. Tricuspid valve, pulmonary valve, aortic valve, and the Mitral well, very good, high five. <laughs> it's a bit like having a, you know when you buy a car, you can buy a good car or a not so good car. You got the most expensive, you got you, the doors inside your heart are the best and the most expensive. They're like a Mercedes Benz. So your heart is like your engine, so it's very important to look after the engine. So taking your medicine is just like putting engine in a car, okay? To making sure that everything goes very smoothly, okay? To make sure that your blood is not too thin and to make sure it's not too thick. You can give me the thin box of medicine. Yes, so I'll be bringing you the box of medicine tomorrow morning mm. to make it really easy for you to take the medicine because it tells you the what Monday, the, Tuesday, yeah. Yeah, Monday, Tuesday, it tells you if you need to take in the morning or in the evening time as well. Yeah. Okay. I'll take it every morning. Every morning, yes, very good. Yes. More better. Yes. It's unbelievable that it, it is one of the most prevalent disease in the world. There are hundreds of thousands of new cases every year and it's amazing to see how little research is done on these patients. The tragedies are that it affects kids, that we know the cause and that we know how to get rid of it. It's really sad to see children at 15 years of age to have their third open heart operation. That's really sad. It's especially heartbreaking because we picked this up early and we could have prevented it. We know what to do. We know how to do it, we know what we need to do, so it's just all about getting out there and doing it.